John, what are some of the principles that you have to uh, view uh, and get your own perspective on uh, the philosophy of evolutionary biology? Okay, so um, I might start by um, mentioning uh, a principle that is central to much of my work, which is pluralism um, of various kinds. In this case, I think where the pluralism leads me is to be very skeptical of too much generalization about how the evolutionary um, proce process works. So, for example, um, I think that the evolution of... So, so one way of saying this is, is um, which will tie perhaps to my next point, is evolution evolves. Um, the evolution of multicellular sexual organisms is quite different in many respects to the evolution of single-celled asexual bacteria. And this leads us to different kinds of um, species. In the one case of species, I'm inclined to think of something that actually evolved um, with um, sexual organisms. This is not an entirely new view. I think um, Ernst Meyer probably thought this a great 19th 20th century um, evolutionary biologist. He just didn't care much for asexual organisms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but um, so that's that's when I think we should be uh, open to a good deal of diversity in the evolutionary process. Another idea that I I'm very keen on relates particularly to my processual view of the world and. It makes me think a little bit more about the processes that actually are where evolution happens, uh, which are called lineages. I mean, that's, I didn't invent that term either. Um, but I think it, it's everybody knows that um, you know what evolved as some kind of um, uh, entity at any rate at the level higher level than the individual. That individuals don't evolve, and I think most people would agree that what really evolve are. Um, lineages, sequences of populations or species that, that go through time. But I think we don't um, pay enough attention, partly because we're looking for things rather than processes, to the actual nature and properties and behavior of these, these things. I think, for example, it's probably one of my most unfashionable views, which <laughs> I've come to lately, and that's saying something, <laughs> um, <laughs> is um, that um, and this is not, again, is not a unique view, but it's um, for, perhaps for a different reason from some, is that we should mostly think about um, natural selection as stabilizing rather than as a primary explanation of novelty. And I partly say that because one of the things the process perspective tells you is you should look for explanations of the stability of a process um, more even than you sometimes because the in. default condition is process and change and so you don't have to explain the process because that's default what you have to explain is how how there can be a substance or, or a thing that, exactly. that stops so it's exactly the opposite uh, way essentially of i mean of course I, I wouldn't quite go so far you, you yeah. sometimes need to explain changes but i think what what we tend to overlook is that we actually certainly in biology um and and in general in a process world what a great deal of our explanation is an explanation of how something continues to, to it said, look like a substance. Yeah. I mean, we carry on much the same over time. And of course, again, it's, 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 a, it's the, you know, the, the duck with all the, or the swan with all the activity <laughs> under the surface <laughs> glides along, but it takes a lot to keep it there. Yeah. And, and so the, the evolutionary question shifts a little bit from explaining how one thing or a substance changes to another to why the change process, the, the process itself, stabilizes at a, a certain point. Yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah, indeed. I mean, it, it's, it's the lineage, after all, has survived for several billion years up to us. So something has kept this process going. Mm -hmm. It has along the way uh, responded to changing environments, developed new um, new capacities. 
even develop new ways of evolving. As people now talk and say, talk about evolving evolvability, mm -hmm. that we have new yeah, right. forms of evolvability, um, which we need because we don't, we don't have nearly the selection we had when we were, you know, like um, fish producing a million eggs a year. Mm -hmm. um, but we're doing it in a different way. And we have new processes like cultural evolution, which obviously only comes sure. when we're sufficiently complex to have culture. Mm. And these, this is a new dimension of evolvability that we've acquired relatively recently. So if you take the two together, a pluralistic metaphysics of the evolutionary process and focusing on process mm -hmm. as opposed, and needing stability as opposed to having stability and, and needing to explain change, what would be the implications of that uh, for evolutionary biology? Well, um, I think that's, that's a very big, very hard question. I suppose one, if I were to relate it to real debates, I would, I would very much come down on the side of the extended evolutionary synthesis in the sense mm. that I think the, the, um, the modern synthesis tends to be, on the one hand, um, looking for uh, a kind of uniform view of evolution and moreover in many versions of it though this is complicated but in for very many familiar versions of it doing so in a kind of reductive way that looks at everything as actually you know the, the gene selectionism um, is the extreme case of a, a kind of reductive view which is completely antipathetic both to pluralism mm -hmm. and the process theory. Uh, so uh, I think that the, the extended and extending view that is, is always you know, looking to create a, a more nuanced and diverse and perhaps sometimes complex picture is the way both of these philosophical tendencies should push us.